Okay. I'm going to try and begin by something that may prove counterproductive, because I'm going to try and tell you in two sentences what will later take me 30 minutes to complete. And once I'm done, you will have the option of leaving, but I hope you don't. It might prove interesting. Um, basically, the, the point of my talk is this. Um, the Islamic Revolution and the thinkers of the Islamic Revolution have to some extent been done to death. They've been analyzed through and through. Their writings have been read and discussed and uh, interpreted in all so many ways. And yet, I think there is one significant aspect of this thought that has been neglected, left unanalyzed almost completely. What I'd like to suggest in my talk today is that several of the prominent thinkers of the Islamic Revolution corresponded with modernity and attacked modernity basing their endeavors on some of modernity's difficulties, faults, and, well, I guess I could call it points of lack. They went after modernity from perspectives that modernity has a hard time acknowledging. What I'd like to do today is try and read the writings of one of these prominent thinkers, or at least one of his books, through perspectives that I believe modernity has a hard time with. I'd like to concentrate on categories of religious thought, try and read some of these religious writings through modern Western categories of religious thought, and I'd like to focus on modernity's difficulty uh, when it is forced to handle emotions, feelings, uh, bonding mechanisms, and subject-forming mechanisms, as psychoanalysts call them. Well, that sounds a little intimidating, but I'm going to do this through four texts from one of the most popular books, I believe, in Iran in the last half century, Murtaza Mutahari's Dastan Rastan. Um, and I'm going to try and read the texts and try and point out how they may be understood differently through these perspectives I've just suggested, and what they can teach us about Islamic thought and about its reaction and correspondence with modernity. As I said, one of the sorely lacking methods of analysis when discussing the Islamic revolution is religion. Strangely enough, I mean, it was a religious revolution, and yet these people, these prominent thinkers, are hardly ever taken seriously as religious thinkers. Their religious logic is always subordinated to the logic of politics, the logic of sociology, the logic of philosophical liberal modernist thought. It is hardly ever, har hardly ever has anyone tried to actually read these people as religious thinkers and try and ponder their religious dynamic, try and guess at their religious hermeneutic mechanism. Now, I suggest doing exactly that, trying to approach them through categories of religious thought. But in order to do this, one has to settle on uh, the religious thought one would choose. Now, the obvious would be to go after, um, to try and, and initiate this search from Islamic thought. Because religion is a local phenomenon, because religion sprouts up in a historical context, and it is not universal or timeless, but it is very much a context-oriented phenomenon. However, I'd like to say that if we can analyze the thought of Islamic revolutionaries sociologically, if we can try and find in them categories of modernity, it shouldn't be too hard to try and adapt the critical religious language that has evolved in the West over the last 150 years to this thought. I'm going to try a specific exercise. I'm going to try and adapt some of the categories formulated by one of the greatest religious thinkers the West has ever had, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, to the thought of this, this specific Islamic revolutionary. Now, the text I'm concerned with, the book, Dastan Rastan, first published in 1960, uh, without going into too much detail about the book or its author, I'd say that uh, it is a book that has um, several dozen, well, more than a hundred, I think, short stories, tales, parables, that are intended to convey moral lessons. Uh, in its introduction, the author says that this is a book that is meant to describe to the young people of Iran how history actually happened. Of course, 
any relation between this book and historical fact is fictitious to say the least. But it is a book that was meant to carry a point at a time when the Islamic camp was beginning to form as a viable political option. It was a book that intended to say, look, if you support us, here is what you will get. I'd like to say it is also a book that reflects a profound religious perception of the world, that a close reading of some of the texts included in it will reveal both the crises and the answers that the Islamic ideology tries to provide as opposition and alternative to modernity. So why don't I start off with a text. This text is called Weightlifting. The young Muslims were occupied with feats of strength, holding a weightlifting contest. A big rock which stood at the scene was to serve as the test for their manhood. Each of them attempted to lift and move the stone. While they were thus occupied, the messenger arrived and asked, What are you doing? We are holding a test of strength, they said to him. We wish to see which one of us is the strongest. Would you like me to tell you who among you is the strongest and has the most power? Of course. What is better than having the messenger of God judge our contest and reward the winner? The people gathered, waited expectantly. Who would the messenger choose as champion? Several imagined, each to himself, how the messenger approaches them, holds their hands and crowns them champions. And then the messenger said, The strongest and most powerful of all is he who, when a thing appeals to him and attracts him, will not let his connection to this object harm his humanity and his quest for truth, and will not let that object contaminate him in any way. If he should become angry and a tidal wave of rage rise in his heart, he will maintain self-control, speak nothing but the truth, and will not let a curse or a lie cross his lips. Should he be powerful and influential with no obstacles in his way, he shall reach for naught but the scales of truth and justice. Now reading this story didactically, the message is clear. Uh, Prophet Muhammad preaches a message of tolerance and moderation, claims that the strongest... Uh, uh, this is a message that is repeated throughout the monotheistic world. A hero or a champion is one who subdues his needs and desires. So that, that's pretty much understood. But let's read the story like people encountering a text. Let's try and imagine ourselves in the world that this text unfolds before us. When we read it like that, the text sounds a little different. The young Muslims are holding a feat of strength. They're having a weightlifting competition. Anyone who can lift the rock will be the winner. And suddenly, in a moment, the prophet appears. And he says, well, would you like me to tell you who among you is the strongest? And they say, well, of course. And then they imagine themselves being crowned. And then he launches into the strangest speech that has nothing at all to do with the object of the competition that goes against the grain of the basic human actions that, were that had unfolded in the narrative we were presented with. He has this spiel about somebody being moderate and strong and just and speaking only the truth. Well, let's ask the first basic question. Why do the young Muslims need him? Why would they want his assistance as judge? Obviously it provides prestige. It grants greater honor to the man who wins. But it's also obvious who wins. The person who lifts the stone wins. This moment of arrival splits the story into two different, two parallel universes. There is the human world, where things go on as they always have. And then there's this weird divine intervention that has a logic all its own and a language all its own. By the way, I think it's fairly obvious who the prophet is referring to as the strongest and most powerful of all. That's pretty obviously him, right? Not anybody in the crowd. Okay? So, I'd like to suggest that this story reveals the basic moment of revelation, which as far as I'm concerned is a very important religious category. The moment when the eternal encounters the temporal. Right? When God comes down to earth. Although this is the prophet and not God himself, but he is the messenger. And this moment is a moment of crisis. Look, it... It doesn't say, the story doesn't end with the people embracing Muhammad's words. It doesn't end with anybody being crowned champion. The whole human agenda has been discarded in favor of learning the divine message. But there's a breaking point here. A point where these two paths diverge and do not meet again. This point of crisis is where, this, uh, where I'd like to place the beginning of this Islamic thought. And it is approached through religious categories. Kierkegaard formulated this category of the moment as one of the most important in a religious existence. How does one respond when one encounters God? 
Now, of course, he did this through a Christian perspective, but the question remains and is relevant and prurient for any religious discussion. How does one respond? What does one do? From this story, apparently, one does nothing. One bows one's head before the inevitable, receives the divine words, but what happens then? Do they go on with their lives? After this competition is over, is anybody crowned the winner? Or does the prophet walk away with the trophy? This is a question that should be asked in religious terms because we'd have difficulty asking it in any other terms. It, it, it's part, part and parcel of the basic world view of the perception presented in this text. Now, I chose this specific story because at this point of crisis is so clear and because it has no resolution. Just this moment, this moment where one is supposed to learn the eternal truth or to be changed utterly by this encounter with God, and apparently, none of this happens here. The story is left open. In its way, it, it resembles a Zen Buddhist koan. Because it has no resolution, because it defies the usual conventions of narrative. But we are people, and we are used to structuring our lives in the framework of narrative, and we look for narrative. Which only, I think, makes the point stronger, more prominent. If somebody were to read the story, what would they come away with? Except for the notion, well, except for the lesson in the end. What would their relationship towards God be? How would they believe? That's an initial question. I'd like to move on to another story, which displays these difficulties in a much more pronounced way, and which will allow me to carry this analysis over uh, into another interpretative field that uh, perhaps will, will also help me to, in illuminating these difficulties of modernity that I'm talking about. This one is called Basnati. Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Nasr Basnati, one of the great scholars of his generation, corresponded at length with Imam Reza. During this correspondence, they both asked each, each other questions and answered these questions. After a long period of correspondence, Basnati asked to meet the Imam in person. I wish to come to your house and take advantage of your presence, he wrote. Of course, this is only when work will not impede and my presence will not burden you when you are busy with government. One day, Imam Reza sent his personal chariot and summoned Basnati to him. That evening, they set up half the night, busy with religious questions and answers. Basnati, of course, raised his questions and the Imam answered them. Basnati felt great pride at the time, feeling as though he could not encapsulate the happiness which filled him. The evening passed and it was time for bed. The imam turned to his servant and said, I ask that you make my, my bed for Basnati so that he may rest. This gesture of affection moved Basnati very much. The bird of his imagination took wing. In his heart, he said to himself, no one in the world is luckier or happier than I am. The imam sent his personal chariot to summon me and brought me into his home. Then he sat up with me half the night and answered my questions. And to add to all that, when it came time to sleep, the imam ordered his personal bed made up for me. Who is happier and luckier than me in the whole world? Basnati was a captive in his own fantasy, detached from the world and everything happening in it. Suddenly, Imam Reza turned to him while he was lifting his hands from the ground and preparing to leave. With two words, Ya Ahmad, he cut Basnati's cord of thought. The Imam said, Do not patronize others or be haughty about what happened yesterday night. Sa'se'e ibn Suhan, who was one of Ali ibn Abi Talib's closest friends, became sick. Ali came to visit him and showered him with gestures, gestures of love and affection. He passed his hand over Sa'se'e's body from head to toe. But when he wished to leave, he turned to Sa'se'e and said, Don't be haughty because of what happened here. This means nothing and proves nothing regarding you yourself. I was merely carrying out my duty. No one may take advantage of duty to prove anything. Now this for me is a strange story. A, a disturbing story, if I, if, if I may be so bold. And I'd like to suggest that this story describes a psychoanalytic curve. It presents to us the person, the subject, in this Islamic worldview. Now keep in mind that the interpretation I'm offering is not a usual textual interpretation. It is an attempt to, to describe to you or to see for myself the world before the text. 
the full title of my talk was The World Before the Text, Reading and Imagining Mutaris Dastan Rastan. What is the point of this world before the text? This is looking at the text and trying to see myself in the world this text describes. It obliges me to place myself in this world, to try and understand how I would respond ethically, normatively, culturally to the dictums this world produces, to the insights that originate in it. Now, this interpretation is highly personal, but it is also emotional, communicative, and hopes to try and encourage the people who hear it to place themselves in the same world. It is also, very, I think, religious in a, in a very deep way. It is religious because it assumes that in any interpretative world, in any world which we occupy, there is one central concept which serves both as the place where stories originate and where they lack completion. It is the explanation for everything, but it also sums up the difference, the lack of answers, the places where we are left stumped. In a religious text, this concept is God. Okay? God is not only the answer and the origin to everything, but He is also where the stories which are not complete end up. God is also the stuff we don't understand, not just the stuff we do understand. I am following in the footsteps of, the great, of great French hermen, hermeneuticians and also a few other smart people. I am suggesting that this technique of trying to understand the world before the text would place me, the interpreter, myself, as this originating concept to which all stories return and from which all stories begin. In this way, I believe this interpretation is religious, and it is through this religious interpretation that I'd like to discuss how strange this text I just read is. I mean, first of all, look at the language. Basnati, who is one of the greatest scholars of his generation, he talks like a 15-year-old rock groupie. Who's happier than me? I can't, I can't hold all the happiness that fills me. All he wants to do is go to, his, go to the imam's house and talk to him and touch him and feel him and create the most basic empathic bond, right? a bond between people. He wants the Imam's presence to fill him. He recognizes a gap within himself. But when he comes there, after the Imam treats him kindly, the Imam turns to him and says, look, everything you thought was true about this encounter, any notion you had of why it was important and what you could gain from it, discard it. It's worthless. You haven't understood anything, you can't prove anything by it, you don't understand this logic and don't try to. Now I would like to suggest that this story lets us glimpse a description of the difficulties of modern society, not religious society, but that it does this through religious eyes. One of the most prominent roles of religion, I'll try and say this without getting too deeply into psychoanalytic jargon, because I think that this is a rather accessible idea. One of the most prominent roles that religion sees for itself is to provide its ad adherents with a language that enables them to connect to each other. To bond with each other and to feel a belonging both with each other and to an idea or an entity that is larger than them. Religions, Islam especially, well, I don't know if especially, but very prominently, see their embodiment in communities, in places where intersubjectivity is the basic social dynamic. They exist in a community. A community is the incarnation, is the manifestation of the divine word of God. That's true in Islam as it is in Christianity and Judaism. A community is based on the ability to communicate. And what this story shows us, first of all, is the most basic difficulty that modernity offers to us and that a religious life can offer to us too if we, do not, if we are not capable of facing this difficulty. This begins with the, with the great desire for a model of love, for an object that will love us, that will empathize with us, that will fill us with the language of love that will allow us later on in life to love others. This is the basic desire of the story. While Basnati has his questions answered in the correspondence with the Imam, he wants to come to the Imam's house. He wants to be filled, he wants to touch, he wants the moment. 
because he believes that the moment will change him profoundly. And when the time comes and this moment is enacted, he feels that it has changed him. But how has it changed him? It has not made him a, a better person. It has not improved his status in the world. In fact, the author takes great care to say that the effect of this visit was to lift Basnati above, to free him from the chains of this world. All right? He was captive in his fantasy, detached from the world and everything happening in it. So right away, this desire for the moment, for this encounter with the Eternal, it achieves a result opposite from what the person actually expected. Huh? The person wanted to be improved, the person wanted, wanted to be rejuvenated, and instead the person is taken out of his natural element. His humanity is discarded. His language is discarded. His ability to understand is not relevant. That's the first effect. This is the first time, the first major difficulty that modernity places in our path. This desire to have a loving object, to escape uh, the harsh symbolic order that defines us and judges us and separates us from our, well, from our mothers to begin with, and here I'm being psychoanalytic in the extreme, and it is rebuffed. The second great difficulty that modernity places in our path is the question, how are we to face this rejection? How are we to come to terms with it? One of the basic mechanisms that we often use is we are so shaken up by this rejection that we try and drive our desire for this loving object away from us. We tend to push ourselves to the borders of our personhood. We, are, we, we reach the stage where we are hardly people. We only maintain a shell. We speak a language, but we do not understand it. In a way, that is what, this, what is described here too. What the Imam is saying to Basnati is, your language is irrelevant, you understood nothing. And he not only says this to him, but he says it through a story. By the way, this whole occasion of the story is strange in itself as well, because basically what the story does is repeat exactly what he said to him before. So why does the Imam need a story? He needs a story because he cannot speak directly to Basnati, unless it is on questions of religion of this symbolic order, of the place where God and man can communicate. There can be no interpersonal communication. He has to leave him out in the cold. He can only impart a moral. Okay? And this is very difficult. This is not an easy situation for a person. To have his hopes dashed before him, to be forced to, to hold himself up by his own hair, right? by his bootstraps, to try and come to terms with this great emotional crisis. How does one come to terms with this sort of crisis? I'd like to suggest that the answer to this will also be in a category of religious thought. It will have to involve faith. Faith is the mechanism that religion extends to its adherents when the, mo the difficulties of modernity seem to crush them. Now, why am I emphasizing this notion of the difficulties of modernity? I'll try and explain. Modern societies, as I said in the beginning, have trouble with exactly these, these issues. They have trouble with satisfying their members' desires. They have trouble with this initial crisis of a desire for love and being rebuffed, being separated, being forced to eke out one's own existence under the symbolic, linguistic order of a modern society. Modern society is based on language. The ability to talk is what forms us as subjects. But this ability to talk is based on this initial crisis. We talk because we were rejected. Because we cannot be as one with the mother's body in psychoanalysis, with God in religious societies, call it what you like. We talk because we are not whole. We try and recreate the wholeness that once characterized us through our words. But then there are situations in life when we realize how arbitrary our words are. How irrelevant they are when it comes to understanding how we might be complete again. Now, the crisis is approached through psychoanalytic categories. 
But the answer, or at least Mutahari's attempt at an answer, should be approached through the categories of religious thought. That is his medium. That is where his strengths lie, and that is the answer he wants to give in response to the difficulties of modernity. This in its way is uh, just as profound as the political answer offered by the Islamic Revolution. Uh -huh. This is not just an institutional attempt to replace a regime. This is a world view that understands the failings of modernity at a profound level and seeks to address them. In this story, Basnati is left standing. He, he does it well, hardly standing, really. He doesn't know what hit him. As modern readers of the story, we read it and we feel his anguish. But then again, it's the anguish we all feel. Who hasn't encountered a situation where his desire to receive an answer, to understand an event, to get a full explanation, was so violently rebuffed? This is, it's, a, it's, it's a basic situation of life as modern subjects. Can this text offer an answer? Does it offer an answer? I'd like to say that it begins to, but it must begin with the crisis. It must begin with the paradox. It must begin with the understanding that Basnati can never receive a direct answer from the Imam. It is this lack of answer that will push us forward, that will move us forward in an attempt to try and discover the solution that Mutawi presents, or the beginnings of a solution. I'd like to reiterate this point. Religious thought, well, you know what? I'll take a step back. Modern thought begins with logic. We look at the world, we try and analyze it through our own perception, and when we come to moments that defy our logic, well, we might be willing to recognize them as impossibilities, we might try and work around them, we might try and integrate them into our experience, but they are the exceptions to the rule. I, 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 I trust you all remember Sherlock Holmes' famous maxim, about how when you eliminate the impossible, everything that's left, however improbable, is the truth. That is modern thought for you. Religious thought, and specifically this sort of Islamic thought that is expressed in this text, goes about it the other way around. Religious thought begins with the paradox. That is its initial moment. The understanding that man is not like God, that is where it starts. Logic comes afterwards. Logic is a product of the paradox. Once you look at it this way, this moment that Basnati has is not necessarily a crushing moment. Well, it is in its way. It is also a constitutive moment, a formative moment. Processes begin from such a situation because Basnati has understood how he can never be like the Imam, who is the representative of God in the story, of the divine order. The question is what he does with this understanding, how he handles the enormity of this paradox and its primary status in the construction of a religious subject. Oh, I'd like to suggest, as I said, that a beginning of an answer has to do with the concept of faith. I'll try, I'll try to read, an, I'll like to read another text. This one is called Two Partners. The true partnership and friendship between Hisham ibn al-Hukm and Abdullah ibn Yazid were a marvel for the residents of Kufa. These two men were a model of sound partnership and collegiality. They both managed a haberdashery. They did not have one fight throughout their lives. This especially puzzled the public, being the talk of the town, especially because as far as religious beliefs go, they stood at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Hisham was one of the most renowned among the twelve Shia ulama and mutakalamin, a member of the household of Imam Jafar as sadiq and a firm leader in the imamat leadership of the Prophet's household. Abdullah ibn Yazid, in contrast to Hisham, was one of the scholars of the Ibaziyyah, a Kharijite uh, sect in Islam. An abyss separated their religious beliefs, but they managed to prevent religious affairs from interfering with their lives. They kept on trading, working, and earning with full moderation and cooperation. The most bizarre fact was that they both agreed to an arrangement according to which the Shi's and Hisham scholars would come to the store occasionally where Hisham would teach them the tenets of religion and answer their questions. Abdullah would listen to these talks and never show the sign of anger or inconvenience. Similarly, members of Abdullah's sect would come to the shop and in front of Hisham would proceed with their instruction of religion, which often included criticism of Shi'ism. 
But Hisham as well showed no sign of anger or inconvenience. One day Abdullah said to Hisham, We have between us a full partnership and friendship. You know me well. I want you to receive me as your son-in-law and wish to marry your daughter Fatimah. Hisham answered Abdullah with this short sentence, Fatimah is of the faithful. Abdullah heard this answer, was silent and never spoke of the issue again. It never bothered the two friends and their joint work continued. Only death separated them. What's to be learned from this story? Or how can one proceed with this gradual unveiling of religious perception of the subject in the world? I'd like to talk about the concept of faith here. Now, it's, it, it's rather obvious that um, the didactic message of the story is clear. Right? The faithful are the faithful. No matter how friendly you are with anybody else, once you're a Muslim, you're a Muslim, that makes you different from everybody else, especially if you're a Shi, and that difference cannot be broached. Right? There, there is no bridge to be built over this gap. Through the use of Kierkegaard's category of faith, and through the use of this paradox that I had just discussed, I'd like to suggest a different reading. Faith is what happens when you've looked God in the eye, when you've made the leap towards the eternal, when you've understood how great eternity is and you wanted to grasp it, and then, in the last second, and here I'm quoting liberally from Kierkegaard, in the last second you said, well, no. I'll take my own life instead. I'll stay human. I'll believe in you, but I won't try to imitate you. I'll believe that you can do anything, but I will step back. Faith is when one understands the paradox. When one understands it happily. When the desire to be God is no longer the key mechanism to one's life. Okay? You have made the move to eternity, and then you step back. That is a religious perception of faith. And that is what happens here. Why is that what happens here? Because this is what faith is. Faith is an attempt to embrace life. To prefer friendship over the value of you know, divine intervention. Faith is an attempt, faith, it's not an attempt, faith is a conscious decision to carry on living knowing how great God is. Of course you accept His rules, you do what He tells you. I'd like to refer you to Kierkegaard's wonderful book, Fear and Trembling, that talks about Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac as a model of faith. But even when I don't quote from it directly, this is his model of faith. And this is what happens here. Humanity is preferred, as is friendship. Now these are friends who look eternity in the eye. Because they are scholars, because they know the word of God, and because they understand, they remain true to their word, even when they hear a direct challenge to it. When they hear it being rebuked, they keep on being friends. And the gesture of faith that is shown by Hisham ibn al khuk is exactly one of looking upwards, understanding the greatness of eternity, and returning. I'm accepting God's rules, he says, but I'd still like to be your friend. Now, this is a religious perception of faith. It is not a secular one. In analysis of the Islamic revolution, you often hear phrases, of the sort, phrases which sound like, well, here is where their entire political structure collapses into faith, and then the subject is dropped. I'd like to claim that faith is important. Faith is crucial to the understanding of this discourse. And notice that I've, I've taken great care not to say a lot about the book or its author, one of the prominent intellectuals of the Islamic Revolution. Why? Because I feel the message is powerful, and what is revealed to us when we try and look at it through both tools that psychoanalysis offers, which focus on feelings and bones and crisis and recovery, as well as tools that are offered by critical religious thought, the beginning with the paradox, the importance of the moment, the constitutive significance of, Christ, of this crisis, of the understanding that man is like, not like God, we read these texts differently. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to thank both speakers for uh, really most vivid and uh, illuminating presentations. Um, it's a pity, but we have we are left with no time to have the Q&A discussion, but I uh, think we could all agree that this session has set the stage for uh, 
a very good uh, conference and uh, fruitful sessions to come.